right, and now Grandpa Ryan is going to kids' church, people. <laughs> Ephesians, at least how do we get to where we're at? So if you 
If you look and, and if you were to read, examine chapters one through three, you would see certain themes emerge. You're told uh, uh, who you are in Christ Jesus, and how much God has done for you in Christ. The gospel is the theme of the first three chapters. Know who you are in Jesus. So we're told in the first three chapters, just listen to this for a moment. It helps set the stage to where we're at today in chapter 4. But in the first three chapters, we're told that we are richly blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. We're told that we are chosen in advance by God in Christ and to be holy in Him. We are predestined, chapter 1 tells us, to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. We are redeemed, we're told, through the blood of Christ. In chapters 1 through 3, we see that we're forgiven our trespasses through Christ. These are all themes of the first three chapters. We're told that we're given the revelation of truth in Christ. We're told that we're guaranteed by the indwelling Holy Spirit to possess an eternal inheritance with Christ. With Christ. We're told that we're given the resurrection power of the living Christ. The very resurrection power that raised him from the dead is alive and at work within us. We're told that we who were formerly dead in our sins are now made alive by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's a gift from God, Ephesians 2. We're told also in Ephesians 2 that we're not saved by our works. But we are saved in order to do good works that honor God. We're told that we are one, that we were ones who were far away from God, who've now been brought near to God through Christ, that we are reconciled to God through Christ. That's also chapters 1 through 3. We're told that we're given access to the Father through Christ. You don't need an earthly priest. You don't need to have somebody go between you and God so that you can connect with Him. We're told that we have access to the Father in Christ. We're told that we are made members of God's household. That we're made part, a part of God's temple that He's building up in Christ, the household of God. And we're told this. We are deeply loved beyond human comprehension in Christ. Some of you have experienced relationships of deep love. And in those experiences of deep love, you've also experienced deep pain. Some of you have been betrayed. Some of you have been discarded. Some of you have been left by the roadside of love and treated like trash. But let me just tell you something. You read through Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, and you will discover that is not how God treats you. That is not how he values you. You are absolutely the precious, chosen, purchased possession of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are deeply loved. You'll always be loved in Christ. He holds you fast in his hand, we're told elsewhere in Scripture. And you are deeply, intimately connected to God through Christ. And that is a position that will never, ever change. He will never, ever cast you away. Amen. That is the gospel. He has set us free. God has set us free in Christ. Jesus paid the debt on the cross, the debt that you owe because of your sin. You realize your sin is way worse than you could have ever imagined. We do things that are bad. We do things that are evil. And then we call it by better names because we have to feel good about ourselves with our conscience. But the truth is we are way worse, way, way better, if you will, way more evil than, than we first imagined. But God's grace is way deeper than it all. And in Christ, you are offered complete cleansing, complete forgiveness. You can be washed clean, brought into the family of God through Christ. And you can be a rejoicing saint of God for all of eternity because of what Jesus has done for you. That is chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians. And then at the close of the three chapters that are focused on the gospel, he writes in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 3, listen, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory. Listen to this. Two things. How are you going to get glory? God, how are you going to get glory? Well, to him be glory in the church. Categorize that in your mind. God is going to be glorified through Christ in the church. So he says the church. To him be glory in the church. 
and in Christ Jesus. So if you want to know what is going to glorify God to the maximum throughout eternity, starting now and on into eternity, what is going to glorify God's greatness the most? He mentions two things here, the church <laughs> and Christ Jesus. And he says that's throughout all generations, which includes 2020, the year we're in, this generation that we're a part of. Throughout all generations, God be magnified, God be glorified in the church and in Christ Jesus in each succeeding generation. And then look what he says in the eternity, forever and ever, amen. So be it. It's done. It's going to happen. God is going to be glorified in his church. God is going to be glorified through his son. And they are like this. They're connected. The church and Jesus are connected together. He's writing to the church in Ephesus. Do you know who you are in Jesus? God determines to be glorified in his church just like he determines to be glorified in his son, the Lord Jesus. And so right before he transitions his letter, Paul, at the end of chapter 3, to focus on practical application in verse uh, chapters 4 through 6, Paul points out the importance of Christ's church and Christ's people and the eternal purpose, God's eternal purpose. So it's really interesting. You, you would imagine... That if somebody, you know, somebody said, hey, God's going to be eternally glorified in, in his son Jesus, we'd say amen. But to hear that God's going to be glorified in his church, in Christ's church, and in Christ Jesus, both now and forever, that's a bit surprising. It's both. So it's in the eternal plan and purpose of God. And Paul's showing how the gospel is to impact our personal lives as members of the church. And so chapters 4 through 6, we're in chapter 4 today. In chapters 4 through 6, he teaches, Paul teaches the church in Ephesus to work out, work out the implications of the gospel. Work out the implications of who you are in Jesus that he talks about in the first three chapters. Work that out in your daily life. Work it out in the life of the church. Walk worthy as one is captured by the grace of God. And that's what he says in verse 1 of chapter 4. Look down at the text. Verse 1, if you got your Bible open to chapter 4, look at verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So if you were to just start there today, you'd go, well, now what calling is that? But because we spent five to seven minutes on uh, what chapters 1 through 3 talks about, now we know what that calling is. It's the upper call of God in Christ. It's the gospel drawing us close. And he says, in light of the gospel, in light of who you are in Christ, now you live that out in your daily experience and in the life of the church. You walk in a worthy manner. And so in chapter 4 through 6, he, he outlines how do you do that? How do you walk in a manner that is worthy of the call that you have in Christ? And so today... We're going to see two things that we must do to walk a worthy walk in Jesus. If you're taking notes, first of all, in order to walk the worthy walk, we must receive and apply the instructive guidance. Receive and apply the instructive guidance from Christ's appointed gifts to his church. Verse 11. Back at verse 11. And he, as Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. I want you to think about Philippians 2 with me for just a moment. A little aside to help us get a little bit of the backdrop of the concept here of what's going on. God sent Jesus, and Jesus, the second person to try in God, had came down and took on flesh. He humbled himself. So think of Jesus, God the Father, the Spirit, all in harmony eternally in, in the past. And, and in time, Jesus left heaven and came down and took on flesh. He became one of us, and he retained his Godhead, uh, Godhood. He retained being God, 100% God. He took on 100% humanity. He's the 100% God. Man. Okay? So he lowered himself to do that, and he lowered himself to learn obedience, and he lowered himself to go all the way to the cross. Right? And he died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. Which, by the way, was the beginning of his exaltation because it was a rich man's tomb. He comes out of that tomb, raised to life by God the Father. He goes out and shows himself to many witnesses, right? And then he, what does he do? He ascends back 
to his rightful place of glory. He receives that glorification from the Father, and he is seated at the right hand of God, and he has promised to return. Well, then who's going to lead the thing that he started? Well, hold on now. The one who started this whole thing, he's, he's gone back to heaven. He ascended back to heaven. Well, now, who's supposed to lead this whole movement that this Jesus started? I mean, he raised from the dead. He ascended back to heaven. And Now, who are going to be the leaders in this thing, this, this ecclesia, this gathered group, this fellowship, this body, this church? Who's going to lead? Who's going to do that? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 21 says, So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Listen, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Is that familiar? We just read about them in chapter 4. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So there's your, your ultimate foundation, the cornerstone is Jesus, but he uses to build the foundational elements of the church in the early in the first century, the early church. He built that foundation with his apostles and prophets. They were foundation layers, if you will. First Corinthians 12, 28 says, God has appointed, he has called them out, he's given to them, he's placed them in the church, he has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. So Christ has ascended, he's coming back, but in the interim, who's going to lead? Well, in the early church, we saw that there were the apostles and there were the prophets. He also mentions evangelists, shepherds, or pastors, and teachers. And so some of these uh, offices, apostle, prophet, ended in the first century. You see it kind of fading off, even in Acts. And you see evangelists and pastors and teachers, shepherds and teachers, going on. And that is the case today. So if you want to write something down beside the word apostles in your notes, you can just say one sent out with orders from Christ. Christ himself, he, he called them. He said, you, you're going to follow me. We know that one was a betrayer and they added one in, right? Uh, after, after Christ died. And so these are men who saw the resurrected Christ. These apostles were called by Christ himself. They were given authority to perform miracles, uh, to uh, authenticating signs, if you will. And that connected them with Jesus. Hey, we are representing the one who has ascended. And we're, the, we're the leaders, okay? These were men who were uh, eyewitnesses to Jesus uh, in his resurrection form. And some saw him in his ministry. Most did. The Apostle Paul was one like he was an apostle, born out of his time, if you will. Chosen um, at a time, but made an apostle uh, out of season. And these men, these apostles, served to spread the message of the gospel to Jerusalem and beyond. They were authoritative voices. You might write that inside apostles. Authoritative voices. So they were ones who were set out in orders from Christ. They were authoritative voices representing Christ, representing his message, and ministering to his people during the infancy of the church. So who's left in charge? Well, up at the top of the pile is the apostles in the first century, in the early church. So one sent out with orders from Christ, authoritative voices representing Christ. He mentions prophets. These were most likely the associates of the apostles. They were not themselves apostles. But like the Old Testament prophets, they proclaimed God's message of truth to a particular people at particular places. Paul might say, hey, you know, you go over here for a while, and they might draw them back later. So these were the prophets, also first century guys. But he also mentions evangelists there in verse 11. Evangelists. Evangelion, that is the word in which we get the gospel, the good news, the gospel. And so this word is associated with that. These are men who spread the evangelion, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gifted uh, proclaimers and preachers of the gospel. You might just put beside that. Preachers of the gospel. Ones who are evangelizing, you might put. They're, they're men who are gifted men, spreading the gospel of Jesus with urgency uh, with, for people to respond. Uh, one writer puts it like this. Uh, these were not uh, men who had ten sermons a suit and uh, traveled 
from church to church, you know, their evangelistic ministry. Not that there's anything wrong necessarily with that, but that's, if that's what's in your mind, go ahead and get that out. Um, that's, that's not exactly what it was. You think about it, that one of the writers pointed out that Jesus really was the first evangelist. He was the one who was first proclaiming the good news of the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. He was proclaiming the evangel. He was proclaiming the good news. The kingdom is here. Philip. Now hear, hear this. This is interesting. And remember one of the uh, one of the men in, in Acts chapter six when they chose who would uh, really uh, predecessors of deacon body and who would who would serve in that role. Philip was one of them. Philip was one of those we might say deacons at the early church there in Jerusalem. And he's called though in Acts chapter twenty one verse eight. Listen to this. He's called. Philip the Evangelist. Huh. That's cool, right? So you got this uh, this deacon who is gifted in evangelism. And we're all spread the good news, but he's gifted particularly in that. He's gifted to share the gospel, proclaim the gospel, and to see people respond in power. That's Philip the Evangelist, he's called. Acts 21, verse 8, if you want to write that down. Now, what's the equivalent of evangelist in today's church? We, we might say at the most basic level, anyone who intentionally spreads the good news of Jesus, especially those who have devoted their life to the cause. So, it, you know, you could be filling the role of an evangelist just by influencing people in your sphere of uh, connection. So where you work or maybe some social group or going out to eat or whatever environment you're in and you're spreading the evangel. You're telling people the good news of Jesus as God gives you opportunity. You're kind of filling in that spirit of evangelist, even though it's not an official capacity, doesn't matter. You're sharing the gospel. But then there are those who devote their life to the cause. And they might call themselves, hey, I'm an evangelist. Or they might say, I'm a missionary. You ever heard that term? Of course you have. Now, they, the, the, the people who would say they're missionaries today, who, are, who have given their lives vocationally to being on the front lines of gospel proclamation, making disciples, and, and going on the field, as it were, out of their own culture, and being on, on mission for God, okay? these people would, would have a uh, camaraderie with the apostles, because the apostles were sent here are these missionaries in today's church, and they're also sent, sent by the church and by Christ. And so we support eight missions and ministries that focus on making and growing disciples. Uh, Brother Glenn mentioned the in-gathering offering. We support, we support people do that. We support uh, eight missionaries and missions uh, and ministries on a monthly basis through your regular giving as well on top of the in-gathering. Okay? Uh, so we support uh, missions and ministries at $800 a month. That's just the general giving. In-gatherings on top of that. And then beyond that, we also give a pretty good percentage of uh, what comes in the general budget offering to support four, uh, almost 4,000 international missionaries through the Southern Baptist Convention's International Mission Board, also North American Mission Board, missionaries there for church planting, also helping with church planting and church revitalization with through Florida Baptist Convention. So when you give, it's going out toward missions and ministries here locally and around the world. And so that's also in the spirit of evangelist and trying to fulfill that. Uh, here's one, here's an idea, uh, right out of scripture, 2 Timothy 4, 5, says, always be sober-minded, he's talking to Timothy, Paul is, who's serving in Ephesus, be sober-minded, <clears throat> endure suffering, listen, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So he doesn't call Timothy an evangelist, he doesn't say, hey Timothy, you're an evangelist, but he says, fulfill the work of an evangelist. So as a pastor of the local church, Timothy, I got you there for a while. You may not consider yourself an evangelist, but do the work that one does. Go out and share the gospel. Win people to Jesus. And so I, as a pastor, I am to do the work of an evangelist. I am to do the work of an evangelist. I'm to, I'm to share the gospel. Well, here's the cool thing. So are you. <laughs> so are you you are to do the work of an evangelist you say where do you get that Pastor Jim? well Matthew 28 19 is pretty good. I mean unless you say that's just applying to the apostles in that immediate context which I don't think you have a lot of work for that 
and you're going back a few hundred years prior to the modern missionary movement, if that's your position. Matthew 28 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's for you. That includes evangelizing. That includes sharing the evangel, the gospel, the good news, with people who are lost in their sin. Acts 1 and you'll be my witnesses, he says, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And that's after you receive power from the Holy Spirit. We know that the Spirit has come. We have the power of God and the Spirit alive and at work within us. And so that's for ministers of the gospel. That's for common everyday Christians. Do the work of an evangelist. The other day I was sitting at a salesman's table. I'm looking at a particular item and I was thinking about buying. And I've been walking around talking to the guy and mostly listening to him as he... Uh, <laughs> I also thought maybe he was a sailor. I mean, he cussed like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've heard a lot of cussing in my life. But he knows how to cuss. He's pretty good at it. And, uh, and then he started talking about a lot of stuff, and I just kind of listened. And, I, you know, I, I wasn't really shaved. You know, I had a lot of growth going on there, and I was just wearing my jeans and my, my boots and just kind of hanging out, and life was great. So he probably didn't have a clue for what I did. And, and we got to, I told him when I moved to Florida because he asked. I said, I moved to Clearwater. Oh, yeah, well, you know. Okay. Um, so, so I'm listening to him, and finally I was like, well, you know, you were sure you um, So, yeah, when I moved to Clearwater, I was, I was going to finish my undergraduate in Bible to prepare for ministry. <laughs> Peter 2.25 says, 
you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd of your souls and overseer of your souls. The shepherd, there again, Jesus being referred to as the pastor of our souls, his church. He's the, he's the pastor. He's the great pastor, the great shepherd. As a matter of fact, he's the good shepherd, John 10. Jesus said in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. So Jesus is the good shepherd, the shepherd of our souls, the great shepherd of the sheep. Who has he appointed on earth to care for his flock in his physical absence? Pastors. Shepherds. That's the term here in Ephesians chapter 4. They are to care for the flock, nurture the flock, protect the flock. Connected with the next term, they are to feed the flock of Jesus. Next week, we're going to be looking at elders. Same office, just a different term. They're pastors, okay? And he also mentions teachers. Do you see that in your text? Shepherds and teachers, pastors and teachers. These are those who, they who feed the flock of Christ, who feed the word of God to God's people. And according to some students of scripture, the Greek instruction of the text here, when you know, it says uh, shepherds and teachers or pastors and teachers, really it ought to be a hyphenated title, one office, pastor, teacher. That is one of the primary works and responsibilities of a pastor and a shepherd is to do what I'm doing right now, which is to feed the flock, to feed Christ's church, his sheep, the word of God on a regular basis. Is that not what Christ told Peter to do, right? Is that not what Paul told Timothy to do in 2 Timothy 4? He says, preach the word, always be ready whether it's popular or not, do that, preach the word. Thank God for all the gifted teachers in Christ's church that are pastors that also have a gift of teaching. They're, they're expressing that maybe in a small group environment or with children or adults teaching in a class. Maybe going out to the prisons and doing, doing different ministries. Remember this though, if you aspire to become a teacher in Christ's church, James 3.1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. There is that warning. So Jesus gave evangelists and pastor teachers to help grow the established church. Would you characterize your, um, your position in the church as one who follows well? That's not all you do. You might lead, you may serve in different capacities, but Christ has given gifts to his church. And if you look at the context here, the one who has sent it on high and held and brought a host of captives in his train. He gave gifts to men. And then he goes on to talk to you about his ascension and how he'd come to earth. And then he gave. That's what he's talking about. The giving of gifts to the church. And those gifts to the church are the spiritually qualified and gifted men of God who lead. We've seen that in order to walk worthy in Jesus, we must receive and apply the instructive guidance from Christ appointed gifts to his church. Secondly and lastly, we see that to walk, take, take notes, if you're taking notes, here's the next one. To walk the worthy walk, we must habitually engage with others deeply and humbly as we actively honor Christ by building up his church. As we actively honor Christ by building up his church. So in verses 12 through 16, which we've already read, and we'll go through them as we do the study. But in these verses 12 through 16, we read the reason why God gave spiritual leaders to his church. The leaders equip the saints for ministry. You see that in verse 12? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. You see that? So there too, the, the leaders are equipping the saints for ministry with the ultimate goal of having a church filled with people who are committed to Christ and committed to each other. A church that is filled with people who are loving Christ and each other, serving Christ and each other, and maturing in, in Christ and with each other. And so that's my goal. I want to present everybody faultless before God. That's not my work. It's a spirit's work. But he's given me a task to do as a shepherd in the church. To equip the saints to do the work of ministry. He's in, in the ministry. Notice in verse 12. He says to equip the saints. 
One writer talking about this says it's a perfecting, a fitting, or a preparing fully. And so, in some environments, there's a downplay of what happens in the big room, the big room where we gather, and they say, well, there's not a whole lot of life change that happens in the big room. It all happens in the small environment. And mind you, there's a lot of value in that small environment, and I encourage you to sign up for small groups today because there's a lot of value in that. Okay? But let me just tell you something. There is something tremendous that happens in the big room. There's something tremendous that happens when the Word of God is proclaimed and the Spirit of God is taking the Word of God. People's lives are actually being transformed. People are actually being made more Christ-like in the teaching environment of the church. They are actually being equipped to do the work of ministry when they are under the teaching of the Word of God. That is something the Spirit of God does in their life through the proclamation of the truth. You are equipped to do the work of ministry as you take in a steady diet of the taught word. Notice he says it's for the work. For the work. You're equipped to do the work for the work. And sometimes that's difficult. It always takes actual effort. Well, you know what, Jesus, I'll serve you as long as I can fit it in. Because honestly, you see what I'm saying? It's kind of like our attitude, we look at our calendar, we look at the time we have, we don't have, what we really want to do or not do. And we kind of, you know, sometimes invite Jesus to be Lord over this little section right here. Okay, you be Lord, Jesus, right? Because I'm looking at it, it's a nice little slice of my life. You can have that. It's equipping the saints for the work. Sometimes difficult, not difficult, always takes actual effort. There's often sweat of the brow, so to speak, work. But listen, it's very fulfilling. It can be very excruciating, but it's also very fulfilling when you're serving Christ, doing what he's called you to do. I'm not just talking about ministers of the gospel, I'm talking about you, because that's what the text is talking about, equipping the saints for the work. Okay? The work's not a dirty word. Hard is the work. Hard work is not... A dirty thing. It's a blessing from God, actually. Work was given before the fall. You know that, right? Before the fall of Adam and Eve. And when you're serving in Christ's church and serving God's people and doing what he's called you to do to build up the body of Christ, you're actually helping us get back to Eden, in a sense. At least you're moving us toward maturity in Christ. And when Christ comes back and he goes through all that stuff that's going to happen in the eschaton, the end times, and then he fully and finally sets up his kingdom, we're going to be back pre-fall. And even better for eternity. That's so really your work for God gives people a hint of what that's going to look like. Work took on its difficult dimensions when our first parents sinned, and now when applied to the body of Christ, the Church of Jesus, sometimes work has, has some difficult dimensions. Sometimes it's not convenient. Sometimes it's very difficult. And sometimes it's difficult to discipline yourself to serve children. Sometimes it's difficult to commit to, for example, teaching a class, or to commit to being counted on to ministry in some other capacity. The easiest thing is to float. Well, I'll attend, and I'm gonna float. I'm glad you're here, by the way. I'm trying to challenge you to a deeper commitment. What does God have for you in the life of church to build up the body of Christ? That's what this text is about. <clears throat> easiest thing is to stay under committed. Now, for some personalities, it's also easy to get overcommitted. You don't want to do that either. But it's easy to not let yourself get locked in on one thing for which people will expect you to arrive on time, do the work, etc. Well, I'm rather really not being locked in on one thing. Okay. All right. Well, I'm not the Holy Spirit, but I promise you the Holy Spirit will show you what He wants you to do. Okay? So whatever that looks like for you. We're told in this passage that Christ expects us to receive the equipping from the leaders and respond by doing the work of ministry. Notice, notice he says of ministry. That word ministry. It's from the same, same Greek word we translate uh, deacon. Servant. It has to do with service and ministry in Jesus' name. <laughs> so it's a, you're willingly taking on a servant's role as you're equipped to do the work of service. This is practice and serving the one-on-one. -on -one. It's out of the classroom and into, into action. Now some people just, just keep getting equipped. And you've heard the old adage, you've been in church for a while. They're like, like soaking it in like a sponge. And every once in a while you need to squeeze it out. 
Okay? And you can soak in some more equipment. <laughs> Just don't keep getting equipped. Keep getting equipped, but squeeze out. Squeeze out and join along the goodness of God and Christ to others as you serve them. Amen. Verse 13. How long is this to go on, this equipping and building up the body of Christ? When he says in verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, it's believing the truth together, the church, and the knowledge of the Son of God, the mature manhood, the measure, of the stature, the fullness of Christ. So until, we, uh, until unity is achieved in doctrine, until unity is achieved in the knowledge of Christ, until God's people are full-grown spiritual adults, mature to the richness of, in the rich, richness of the Christ life, the measure of the fullness of Christ. And so it's just it's an ongoing thing because there's another generation that's coming up. And so it just keeps going. And Christ keeps ministering to the church and we keep ministering to the church and we cooperate together. And something that Jesus is coming back. <coughs> He's going to finalize the whole thing. In verse 14, we, let's read that together. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So Paul uses two ideas to illustrate the need to grow up and mature in sound doctrine, the truth of God's word. And so the first illustration in verse 14, he says, no longer be children. Uh, one problem we see today in our culture is that some boys grow up and seem to take a decade or so after graduating from, graduation from high school to actually launch out into responsible adult living. There's a term for that that's been coined, and it's called extended adolescent male. <laughs> and so you may see your mid-20s or almost 30-year-old guy still living in the basement and playing video games and going on adventures and, you know, all this stuff that... You know, at some point, stand up and receive man to that brother and move out into life and take on responsibility. Let's try that. Okay? And so, you know, God, God is telling us, let's not be kids anymore. At some point, let's not let's no longer be okay with being children. Let's, let's go to mature manhood. Paul tells the Ephesians, grow up in Jesus. Let that be your goal. Become mature in your understanding. Leave spiritual immaturity. That's what he's saying. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 and 14. Um, I, I think it's Paul writing, but we'll, we'll find out in eternity. He says, for though by this time you are the teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So uh, in that passage too, uh, God's got people being chided for being comfortable staying in their childishness spiritually. And he's urging them just like Paul saying in Ephesians 4, the goal is to leave your childishness spiritually and embrace maturity in Christ. Grow up in Christ. There's a second illustration he uses in verse 14. It's a ship tossed in the sea and drifting with the wind and waves. You see that? Uh, we recently went on a cruise to the Caribbean. We were not able to get off of one of the ports because there were so, um, so, you know, such choppy waves and the wind was blowing strongly. And as we sailed back toward Florida, about a day and a half, we were tossed like a rubber duck in a bathtub filled with a, a boisterous kid. I mean, it was unbelievable. I don't drink alcohol. I just don't. I'm a teetotaler. If you do and you get there by grace, it's okay. Whatever. We'll talk. But I don't. And I, you know, if that's what it's like to be drunk, keep it, brother. I don't know. I mean, I walk around the ship going like this, you know, and uh -oh. You know, God forbid somebody was actually drinking on the ship, and I know they were. Maybe they, maybe they walked straight. <laughs> anyway, I mean, that ship was just going like this. It was crazy. I've never been on a ship that was doing quite that, that badly. And Paul says here in verse 14, yeah, we don't want to be tossed to the throne by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cutting, craftiness, and deceitful schemes. So we're to be <clears throat> mature in Christ, adult Christians, and how we think, act, as believers so that we're not tossed about by the wind of three church killers. And you mentioned some right here, false doctrine. Oh, 
oh, did you hear what that preacher on TV was talking about? I just love how he preaches and she preaches. I just love him. Makes me feel so good. And, you know, he, and, and, and really they bought into some false doctrine. And they're kind of walking down the path of false teaching. But it sounds good, tickles their ears, makes them feel nice. And they just suck right into it. And Paul's like, hey, you need to get to the place where your ears are trained and your heart. Is, is tuned in, and your mind and your, and your soul are saturated with the scriptures, and you have been equipped, and now you're mature in Christ, and you know sound doctrine. You're not tossed about like that ship on the water. You're not tossed about by the human cunning, uh, meaning there are people who come into the church and they are intentionally trying to deceive. They're trying to turn people away from the truth. A lot of the cults and isms and spasms started with people coming out of the true church and twisting off to just a little variation of the truth, which brought people way, way, way away from the truth ultimately and down to hell and death forever. So human cunning and it's this craftiness and deceitful schemes. Got a church or a place where you understand what true doctrine is. That's why it's so important to get a teaching of sound gospel preaching. <coughs> In Acts chapter 20, Paul went to Miletus and he called for the Ephesian elders. You might say the pastors, because that's what you're familiar with. But the text there says the elders, same guys. He calls for the elders of the church at Ephesus to come meet with him. And he tells them, hey, I'm not, you're not going to see my face again. I know what I'm going to die. But I want to give you some final instructions. And he's about to send them back to the church at Ephesus. But he says this, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, which, by the way, is another technical term for the same office, elder, overseer, pastor. To care for the church of God, that's the ministry of pastoring, which he has obtained with his own blood. Now listen to this. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Mm. And thankfully, the elders of the church listened to Paul's warning. They went back and they taught the church well. And the church matured in doctrine. And the people in the church matured in doctrine. They protected the church from false teachers and false doctrine, from human cunning and, and craftiness and deceitful schemes. They were strong doctrinally. They knew the truth. Now, how do we know this happened? Well, because about 30 years later, the aged Apostle John writes a very short letter to the Ephesian church. In it, he compliments them on their steadfast adherence to sound doctrine. Listen to this. Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Listen, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Pause. Full stop. There's your compliment to the church at Ephesus 30 years later. Great job. Holy Spirit through John the Aged Apostle tells the church that great job. You guys have been strong doctrinally. You've kept out the false teachers. Oh, what, what? There's more. But this I have against you, Jesus says through John, because that's who's talking. But this I have against you, Jesus says, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. And do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you may repent. An infection had come into the life of the church in Ephesus over the years. It was passionless, lifeless, loveless orthodoxy. They had right doctrine and they had zero love for Christ. They had left their first love. Their, their mind was in the right place. Their doctrine was settled and solid. False teachers, not welcome. But neither was a heart of love for Christ. They had lost their first 
love, Jesus said, repent the works you did at first. If Jesus were to write you a letter, what would he say? Would he compliment you for believing the right things, for growing, maturing, and getting into the word of God, and praying, and maybe giving, and serving? And would he get on your case for a lack of passionate love for Jesus, his word, and his people? It's really interesting that Jesus, the thing that he chides and gets on the case in the church at Ephesus 4, 30 years later, after this little letter is written, is not using sound doctrine. It's the issue of a heart of love. It is so easy to get lulled into complacency and thinking, hey, I believe the right things. I'm doing certain things for God. And our hearts are not just overwhelmed with a passionate love for Christ. It is much better to sit at the feet of Jesus and meditate on the cross and think about what he has done for you and who he is in your life and stir up that passionate zeal for Christ. And then the work that you do will be a work of love, not a work of obligation, not a work of, oh my goodness, i got to go do that again. Why did I ever obligate myself to that? But instead, it'll be, Jesus, you are so amazing. I love you so much because you have loved me first. And so, therefore, I'm going to tell this person about Christ. I'm going to go do what I committed myself to do. I'm going to give. Like I said, I was going to give. I'm going to serve you. But it's because I love you. That's how I show my love for you. May Jesus be loved at Calusa Baptist Church. If there is ever a Sunday that Jesus is not mentioned and glorified, Oh my goodness, I'm going to walk out of here with my head all in shame. Amen. Because God has put forth Jesus to be adored and magnified. And he wants it from his bride. And that's why he told the church who had everything doctrinally correct, you have lost, you've left your first love. Repent and do the works that are associated with that first love. Again, we're going to come Remove your lampstand. He wants right doctrine and warm affections. We need a revival of love for Christ. The results in living for Christ. And Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ controls us. Am I saying the text compels us? It, it draws us in and it controls how we live. Because we have concluded this, he goes on to say, One has died for all. Jesus died for all. Therefore all have died. And he died for all. Listen, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So it's the love of God in Christ that motivates our service. That motivates our quest for maturity and growth together as the people of God. Last two verses, 15 and 16. Look what he says in Ephesians 4. Rather, speaking the truth in love, for to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. Christ is very interested in his universal church, the Big C Church. And you know what church that is, right? It's First Baptist. They're all Southern Baptists. I'm just kidding. He's interested in his big C church coming together in unity and growing up and maturing in Christ. And not one of us has got it all right. Christ will fix all the stuff in every single denomination and make us all mature in Christ because we truly know him. Someday he's going to fix all that, okay? We're doing our best by God's grace uh, in this church. We're part of the Southern Baptist Convention. We're not ruled by the Southern Baptist Convention. We choose to cooperate with them for mission and ministry. Okay? Uh, there's other denominations out there, and they are uh, also cooperating together for mission and for ministry. And so uh, our, our big flags we're waving, we're not going to going, yeah, Southern Baptist! We're going, yeah, kingdom of God, Jesus, this church! Amen. That's what we're doing. And because that's what Christ does. I, he keeps showing up here. I'm really grateful for that. That's, that's really cool. That's awesome. The truth 
is a noble and right goal. But notice that it too must be presented in the love and spoken in love, verse 15. And remember what the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 says. <clears throat> if I have all prophetic powers, understand mysteries, all knowledge, have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am what? Nothing. So it's got to be love, speaking through the love. And in verse 15, he also talks about how the body of Christ is vitally connected to the head of the church, the head of the body, who is Jesus. Uh, no headless horseman here. Okay? No headless body here. We're part of the body of Christ, the church, and Christ is the head. We get our uh, marching orders from him. We get our sustaining grace from him. Uh, it's all about him for him. And so we don't operate and function apart from the head. We work closely with Jesus, led by Jesus, ruled by Jesus, taking our marching orders from Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Can you say that? It's all about Jesus. Try one more time. You mean it? It's all Whatever we make in church our, about our preferences, we lose sight of the star of the show. Maybe not put the right way, but the star of the show is Jesus. Right? We lose the goal and purpose of it all when we make it about us. It's about God's glory in Jesus. How many of y'all have walked around your house and stubbed your toe? <laughs> Yeah, How many of y'all did that in two curse? <laughs> Fewer hands. That's nice. Okay. Let, one of, let one part of your body get sick. Let one part of your body stub the toe, right? And your whole body feels it. Let, let one part of your body stop functioning. The rest of your body knows it, right? The body of Christ, the church, is one body. One body. It's Christ's body on earth. And those who truly confess Jesus as Lord, those who are trusting in Him alone, not, not faith plus works, but trusting in Christ alone, His finished work on the cross, the empty tomb, His life given to them. We are one body. We represent Him to a watching world. He's given leaders to the church to build her up, to equip her, to engage in the works of ministry that further builds up the church. And so let me ask you this. Are you, to use the text terms, are you working properly, verse 16? Are you a part of the church that's working properly as the body and body of Christ? Are you a contributing, serving, praying, attending, encouraging, and on mission member? Are you walking the worthy walk by habitually engaging with others deeply and humbly as you actively honor Christ by building up his church, verse 16? The body builds itself up in love. I invite the worship team to come up. And as they come up, I would, I'd like for you to just bow your head and close your eyes in the church congregation. Just in, your, just in your seat right there. Tune in to what God has for you. We've spoken many things. And maybe there's one thing in particular that stands out in your mind. And maybe it's, maybe it's the gospel. Maybe you're here today, you know you're a sinner, and you know you're lost, you know you need Jesus, and you want to receive the gift of God in Jesus Christ today. And if that's you, trusting in Him alone, by faith in Jesus alone, I invite you to just simply pray to Him. Pray something like this. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. There's nothing I can do to please you. But I trust that Jesus paid for all my sins on the cross. That he was buried and that he rose back to life on the third day. I turn from my sin and I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And by faith I say, Jesus is Lord. Nobody looking around, if you prayed that, the very first time and you mean business with God and you're giving your life to Jesus and trusting in Jesus today. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I just want to see your hand. I want to be able to pray for you. If you prayed and trusted in Jesus this morning, let me just see your hand. Okay? Okay? Anybody else? Got two. For those of you who raised your hand, you need to connect with somebody. I would love to talk to you. 
I'm going to talk to you after church. We're going to talk to you sometime this week, whatever's convenient for you. And talk about your new faith in Christ and what next steps are for you. And Father, I just pray that you would continue the work in us that you have begun. Make us conform to the image of your Son, Jesus. Is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. This is your opportunity.